Hey everybody, so today we are going to be reading chapter the second from the Enola Holmes mystery series. Let's get into it. Chapter the second. After sipping the tea urged upon me by Mrs. Lane, I changed into dry knickerbockers and started off to deliver my notes to the village. But the rain, the wet, Dick will take them, Miss Lane, Mrs. Lane offered wringing her hands in her apron again, her, her grown son, she meant, who did odd jobs around the estate, well, Reginald, Reginald, the somewhat more intelligent collie dog, supervised him. Rather than tell Miss Lane I did not trust Dick, which, with this important errand, I said, I shall make some inquiry, inquiries while I'm there. I will take the bike. This was not some old high-wheeled bone shaker, but an up-to-date dwarf bicycle with a new mix tires, perfectly safe. Pedaling through the drizzle, I stopped for I stopped for a, se a moment at the lodge. Ferndale is a is small for a hall. Really only a stone house with its chest puffed out, so to speak, but it needs but it needs must have a drive, a gate, and therefore a lodge. Cooper, I asked the lodge keeper, would you open the gate for me? And by the way, do you happen to recall opening it for my mother yesterday? To which not masking his astonishment at the at such a question, he replied in the negative. At no time had Lady Andora Holmes passed this way. After he let me out, I pedaled the short distance to Kind Ford Village. At the post office I, office, I sent my telegrams. Then I left off my note at the con constabory and spoke with the officer before I began my rounds. I stopped at the fair carriage at the grocer green grocers, the bakery, the con confes confectionery, the butcher's shop, the fishmongers, and so forth, inquiring after my mother as discreet, discreetly as I could. No one had seen her. The visker's wife, among others, raised her eyebrows at me. I suppose it was because of my knickerbockers. For public cycling, you see, I should have been wearing rationals bloomers covered by a waterproof skirt or indeed any kind of skirt long enough to conceal my ankles i knew my mother cr my mother was criticized for her f failing properly to drape vulgar surfaces such as coal scuttles the back of her piano and me shocking child that i was i never questioned my disgrace for to do so would not would have been to broach the matters of which a nice girl must remain ignorant. Ignorant. I had observed, however, that most married women disappeared into the house every year or two, emerging several months later with a new child, to the number perhaps a dozen, until they either ceased or expired. My mother, by comparison, had only produced my two much older brothers somehow this prior restraint made my late arrival all the more shameful for a gentle gentleman rationalist logistin and his well-bred artist artistic wife the eyebrow raisers bent their heads together and whispered as i pedaled around not going forward again this time inquiring at the end the smithy tobac tobacco constants and the public house the place where places where nice females seldom set foot. I learned nothing, and despite my best smiles and by the way manner, I could almost hear a crescendo of excited gossip conjure around the rumor rising behind me as I returned to Ferndale Hall in an unhappy state of mind. No one has seen her, I answered Mrs. Lane's mute questioning glare, or has any idea where she might be. Again waving her offers of lunch on, though 
Now it was nearly tea time. I trudged up the stairs to my mother's suite of rooms and stood outside the hallway door, considering. Mom kept her door locked to spare Mrs. Lane the trouble. Supposedly, for Lane and Miss, for Lane and Mrs. Lane were the only house servants. Mom cleaned her room herself. She hardly allowed anyone to enter, but under the circumstances, I decided to go ahead. Laying my hand upon the doorknob, I fully expected I would have to hunt up Lane to get the key, but the knob turned in my grasp. The door opened, and I knew in that moment, if I had not known before, that everything had changed. Looking around about me in the hush of my mother's sitting room, I felt rather more worshipful than if I were in a chapel. I had read father's logic books, you see, and Malthus and Darwin. Like my parents, I held a rational rationale of scientific views, but being in mom's room made me feel as if I wanted to believe in something, the soul perhaps, or the spirit. Mum had made this a room of sanctuary of the artistic spirit. Panels of Japanese lotus patterns silked, dressed the walls, drawn back to let in the light upon slender furnishing of maple wood carved to resemble bamboo and very different from hulking dark mahogany in the parlor. Down there, all was the wood, was varnished heavy serge draped it draped the windows, and from the walls stared grim oil portraits of ancestors. But here in my mother's domain, the wood had been painted white, and a pastels, and on a pastel walls hung a hundred delicate watercolors, mom's airy, love, lovingly detailed renovations of flowers, each picture no larger than a sheet of writing paper, lightly framed. For a moment, I felt as if Mum were here in this room, had been here all the time. Would that it say were so? Softly, as if I might disturb her, I tiptoed into the next room, her studio, a plain room with bare windows for the sake of light and a bare oak floor for the sake of cleaning. Scanning the easel, the tinted art, table, the shelves of paper and supplies, I caught a sight of a wooden box and frowned. Wherever mom had gone, she had not taken her watercolor kit with her, but I had assumed. How very stupid of me. I should have looked here first. She had not gone out to study flowers at all. She had gone somewhere. Some why. I simply did not know, and how I had ever thought I could find her myself. I was stupid, stupid, stupid. My step's heavy now. I walk through the next through the next door into mum's bedroom and halted astonished for several reasons first and foremost the state of mom's shining modern brass bed unmade every morning of my life mum had seen it to that i made my bed and tidied my room immediately after breakfast Surely she would not leave her own bed with linens thrown back and pillows askew, elder down comforter sliding onto the Persian carpet. Moreover, her clothes had not been properly put away. Her brown tweed walking suit had been most carelessly thrown over the top of, of the standing mirror. But if not her customary walking outfit, with its skirt that could be drawn up by strings that only petticoats need to get wet or soiled, yet to let down at a moment's notice should a male appear on the horizon. If this is not very practical up-to-date garment for the century, then what had she worn? Parted the velvet drapes to admit light from the windows i threw open the wardrobe doors then stood trying to make sense of the jumble of clothing inside wool worsted muslin or and cotton also dam dam damask silk toll and velvet mom was you see very much a three a free thinker a woman of character a prompt of female suffrage and a dress reform including the soft, loose, authentic gowns advocated 
by Ruskin, but also whether she liked it or not. She was a squire's widow with certain obligations, so there were walking costumes and rationales, but also formal visiting dresses, a low neck dinner dress, an opera cloak, and a ball gown, the same rusty purple one Mom had worn for years. She did not care whether she was in fashion, nor did she throw anything away. There was a, there were the black windows weeds she had worn for a year after my father's demise. There was a bronze green habit left over from her fox hunting days. There was her great caped pavement sweeping suit for city wear. There were, there were fur mantles squilted satin jackets, paisley skirts, blouses upon blouses. I could not make out what garments might be missing from the bewilderment of of mauve, maroon, gray-blue, lavender, olive, black, amber, and brown. Closing the wardrobe doors, I stood puzzled, looking about me. The entire room was in disarray. The two halves or stays of a corset along with other unmentionables, lay in plain sight on top of the marble-topped wash, washstand, and upon the dresser sat a particular object like a cushion, but all a poof, made of coils and clouds of white horsehair. I lifted this odd thing, rather springy to the touch, and making no sense of it, I carried it along with me on my way out of my mother's room. In the downstairs hallway, I entered Lane polishing the woodwork, Showing him my find, I asked him, Lane, what is this? As a butler, he did his best to remain expressionless, but stammered slightly as he replied. That is, um, a dress improver, Miss Enola. Dress improver, but not for the front, surely. Therefore, it must be for the rear. Oh, I held in my hands in a public room of the hall, in the presence of a male, the unwhisperable that hid inside a wo gentlewoman's bustle supporting its fold and, and draperies. I beg your pardon, I exclaimed, feeling the heat of a blush rise in my face. I had no idea, never having worn a bustle. I had not seen such an item before, a thousand apologies, but in an ur urgent thought covered my embarrassment. Lane, I asked him, in what manner was my mother dressed when she left the house yesterday morning? It's difficult to recall, miss. Was she carrying any sort of baggage or parcel? No, indeed, miss. Not even a reticule or handbag? No, miss. Mother, mother Saddam carried anything but of the sort. I think I would have noticed if she were. Was she by any chance wearing a costume with a, um, the word bustle would be indelicate when speaking to the male, with a train, with Torner, very unlike her if so, but if, but with memory dawning in his eyes, Lane nodded, I cannot bring to mind her exact apparel, Miss Enola, but I do recall she wore her turkey black jacket, the kind of jacket that would accommodate a bustle and her high-crowned gray hat. I knew, I knew that hat, meant to be military in appearance, resembling an upside-down flower pot. It was sometimes by the vulgar, called three stories in a basement. She carried her walking umbrella, a long black impotment meant to use like a cane, as sturdy as a gentleman's stick. How odd that my mother should go out with a mannish umbrella, a mannish hat, and yet swishing the most flirtatious feminine tail, a bustle. End of chapter 2